Hello students, welcome back. In this meeting, we will discuss regression discontinuity design, which is another impact evaluation method using econometrics. So we'll start off with the logistic. The contents of this lecture refer to materials in chapter six of impact evaluation in practice by Paul Kepler et al. Mostly harmless econometrics by Joshua Engels and Stefan Tischke as well as the Mastering Metrics by Joshua Andres and Stefan Pichke. So I invite you guys to read uh, the materials in these uh, references. Okay, so let's start with recalling the problem of counterfactuals. Um, in the basic evaluation problem materials, we've seen that for each individual I, uh, we aim to see potential outcomes. The first one is YI1, which is the outcome if the individual receives the treatment, the i equals to 1, and then the counterfactual, which is yi0, the outcome when the individual uh, did not get the uh, treatment or the i is equal to 0. Now, the issue is that we can never see both outcomes for one individual. In other words, there is no parallel world or there is no counterfactual. And so, what we end up is that we can only proceed by comparing those who received the treatment with those who did not. Now suppose that students who score above 75 points on the entrance exam receive a scholarship. What is the effect of the scholarship on some outcome Y? The outcome could be grades or graduation. Now, in the counterfactual framework, ideally we would want to see two grades, YI1, which is the grades with the scholarship, and uh, what would happen to the grades without the scholarship or the counterfactual. And the problem is that for individuals who receive the scholarship, we will never be able to see the grades without the scholarship or YI0. And so again, what we're left with is actually a comparison between individuals who receive the scholarship and individuals who do not receive the scholarship. Now, suppose that now uh, suppose that we observe exam scores for those who received the scholarship and those who didn't. Now, let D indicates scholarship received. So D equals to one if the individual gets a scholarship, zero otherwise. Now, I'm going to introduce another variable which is X, and X is the exam score. So I'm going to write an indicator function. So D of I is going to be equal to 1 if the test score is higher or equal to 75. And so the idea is that the exam score X is going to determine whether an individual receives a scholarship or not. So this exam score is referred to as the running variable, forcing variable, or rating variable. Okay, so Given that 75 is kind of like the cutoff, so let's divide the students into two groups. So the first one uh, are those at or above the 75 point cutoff, and then the other are those strictly below the 75 point cutoff. Now within these two groups, we focus on individuals who are identical. One, individuals just above the cutoff, scored 75 to 77, for example, and those just below the cutoff, scored 70 to 74. And so we're, what we're interested in is actually just to compare individuals who are very close to the 75 point cutoff. So instead of comparing everyone uh, above the cutoff with everyone below the cutoff, we're, we're just interested in looking at individuals around the 75 point cutoff. And so the regression discontinuity research designs compare people or you know other entities such as household or firms who are just affected by the rule with people who are just not affected by the rule. And so the intuition of the regression discontinuity design is that there is little difference between individuals who scored 75 and those who scored 75. Those who score 75 eventually get treatment, but individuals who do not get, uh, uh, but individuals who score 74 do not get the treatment. And so the difference in outcomes between these two groups, those who score 75 and 
uh, those uh, scored 74 is going to be a credible estimate of causal effects. Of course, we're going to look at some assumptions and then and some practical issues to just uh, be confident that we obtain a credible estimate of the causal effects using the regression discontinuity design. But this is going to be the idea. Now, we should be careful though that the estimate is going to be quite specific for a subpopulation. In other words, it's going to be a local treatment effect. It's going to be referred to as the local treatment effect because we're only estimating the impact of individual around the cutoff. So the design was introduced by Thistle, Wade, and Campbell back in 1960. So it's been quite a while, although uh, we haven't seen, um, you know, we we haven't seen the uh, application probably until 19 uh, the late 1990s. But it was a paper at the Journal of Education Psychology entitled "RD Analysis: An Alternative to Ex Post Facts Experiments." So. And the paper looked at the effects of obtaining a merit award on future academic achievements, such as enrolling in a graduate school. So students with a GPO above a certain threshold was given a merit award. So basically, we're comparing between individual around the certain threshold or the uh, GPA threshold. So there are two types of regression discontinuity design. Uh, the first one is the sharp RDD. So the treatment is a deterministic function of a running variable x, and then we also have the fuzzy RDD, which exploits the discontinuities in the probability of treatment conditional on a running variable x. So basically, in the sharp RDD, you just have to know uh, the value of the running variable, and the value of the running variable is going to map you to the uh, is going to map you to the um, treatment status. However, for the fuzzy RDD, the running variable itself may not be able to tell you what the uh, treatment status is. However, um, there is going to be a discontinuities in the probability of treatment. We'll see that um, in the fuzzy RDD portion of this lecture. Okay, so let's start with the sharp RDD. And first, we're going to look at the basic setup. So basically, we're going to have the treatment status denoted by D of I. And the treatment status is a deterministic and a discontinuous function of a covariate xi. And so here I'm going to uh, define di as equal to 1. If the value of the treatment variable is higher or equal to c, 0 otherwise, where c is going to be the cutoff. Now, we have a treatment, d of i is equal to 1, and a control group, di is equal to 0. Again, D is a deterministic function of xi, the running variable. Okay, so we care about the discontinuity in the conditional expectation of the outcome. And so what we're interested in is actually comparing the expected. We're interested in uh, comparing the expected outcome of individual with running variable x close to the cutoff value from above and the expected outcome of um, the individual given um, the expected outcome of individual uh, given that the running variable value is close to the cutoff from below. Okay. In other words, since individuals who are above the cutoff are those who receive the treatment and individuals below the cutoff did not receive the treatment. So basically what we're ended up is comparing the outcome of those who receive the treatment with running variable x closing to the cutoff from above and then the expected outcome of individuals who did not receive the treatment with running variable closing to the cutoff from below. So in this particular case, the causal effect at the cutoff point is going to be the expected difference in outcomes between those who receive the treatment and those who do not receive the treatment conditional on the uh, conditional on the running variable equal to the cutoff point. So this is going to be the causal effect using the sharp regression discontinuity design. Now, of course, uh, for that uh, to be uh, 
a credible causal estimate, we need to discuss the assumptions. So um, the one of the main assumptions that we need is continuity of conditional regression function. So the expected value of the outcome for those who did not receive the treatment, conditional on the value of the running variable, and the expected value of the outcome for those who, did, who received the treatment, conditional on the value of the running variable, are going to be continuous in X. So we'll take a look at a graphical um, depiction on what it what this assumption means. Okay, so basically this assumption states that the potential outcome curves, so both the expected value of the outcome for those who didn't receive the treatment and the expected outcome of those who receive the treatment are continuous around the cutoff point. Okay, and so you can imagine in the graph there are two variables, there are two groups. Uh, the treatment group is depicted by the solid black line and then the control group is depicted by the solid gray line. And you have the outcome on the vertical axis and the running variable on the horizontal axis. And so what you're interested in here is that there is a continuity of the outcome variable for both treatment groups around the cutoff. So Basically, uh, you'll see a function for a treatment and a function for the control group. Now, again, this is going to be an assumption. Why? Because um, ideally, you're not going to be able to see all observations. Okay. In general, you can only see observations for the treatment group uh, and the control group conditional on the definition of the threshold itself. Now in this particular case, those who receive the treatment are actually those below the cutoff and those who, who did not receive the treatment or the control group are actually those who did not receive the, uh, are actually above the threshold. And so the key point here is that we need the continuity assumption in this particular figure um, so that we're going to be able to compare individuals around the threshold. Okay, so this is going to be the continuity assumption. Now, under the continuity assumption, the estimated impact using the sharp regression discontinuity design is going to be a comparison of outcomes of individuals who close in to the cutoff from above, and then the expected value of individuals who did not receive the treatment closing from the cutoff point from below. Okay, so we basically use the individuals or unit with x arbitrarily close to the cutoff point to estimate the impact of the uh, treatment. Okay, so in the previous example, you see an example where you actually obtain the treatment if the value of the running variable is below or equal to the cutoff and zero otherwise. Now, is this following assignment possible? The answer is yes. And so uh, one of the exercises that we're going to do today involves a treatment um, that uh, is given to individuals or students who score below a threshold. So there is a tutorial treatment for those who did not receive a rel relatively satisfactory grade. And those who got a relatively satisfactory grade actually did not go into the treatment or the, tr the tutorial treatment. And so in this particular case, we can actually assign a treatment status for those who are actually below or equal to the cutoff and those who did not receive the treatment at, as those above the cutoff. Okay? And so uh, be mindful of the design of the program uh, to see uh, how you can actually, how you need to actually de determine the treatment status. Okay, so uh, for that case, then um, we're just going to briefly discuss the uh, conditional expectation. The conditional expectation is going to be different because now the treatment group are those who close in on the cutoff from below, while the treatment group is actually those who, cl uh, who close off on the uh, cutoff point from above. Okay, And so again, we're comparing between the expected outcome of the treatment group closing from below the cutoff point and then the expected value of the control group closing uh, to the cutoff point from above. And so the causal effect at the cutoff point is going to be the following. Okay, 
So this is an illustration of the uh, sharp RDD observations. So you have observations to the left of the threshold, those who receive the treatment group, and we also observe um, outcomes right on the uh, uh, to the right of the threshold, which is the control group. Okay. Now, this is quite subtle. However, as you can see, that there is a bit of a jump. Um, at around the threshold. That's something that we probably not be able to see in this particular graph. However, if you now see individuals just around the threshold, you can see that there is that difference. Okay. Now, uh, and if you take an average of individuals with certain um, value of running variable, now you can see that there is that jump around the threshold and that jump is going to be the estimate of the impact of the uh, treatment or the program or the intervention. Now this is something that we're actually going to see and this is something that we're going to analyze in the subsequent exercise. Okay, so basically there are conditions for valid causal inference and these are summarized quite nicely in the paper entitled Standards for Regression Discontinuity De uh, Design. By shock at at all so there are four conditions the first one is that the assignment rule must be clear and followed with a high degree of fidelity the running variable is an ordinal measure with sufficient density on either side of the cutoff point units cannot manipulate their own value of the running variable and the fourth one is that the running variable is used to assign units to treatments Differences in outcomes should not be attributable to other potential mechanisms. Okay, now these conditions can be analyzed using graphical analysis, and this is something that uh, we're going to do uh, in this particular meeting. Okay, so let's start with the graphical analysis, and this graphical analysis is actually an integral part of regression discontinuity design discussions, and so uh, these are something that you need to do. Um, initially before we go on to estimate the impact of the treatment or the intervention. Okay, so again, just to, re to reiterate, I guess a lot of the uh, analysis in regression discontinuity design is going to involve graphical analysis. Um, so in general, we should at least analyze the relationship between the running variable and the treatment status. Um, so the analysis of the running variable and the treatment status is going to allow us whether there is a high degree of fidelity. Second, the relationship between the running variable and the control covariates, density test of the running variable and relationship between running variable and outcomes. So we use a simulated data provided by Jacob, Shu, Somers and Bloom back in 2012 the data provides information to estimate the effects of obtaining a merit-based award on students' outcomes as measured with test scores at time t. And the award is given based on their academic performance in the previous term, t-1, or the pre-test score. So basically, the pre-test score is going to be our running variable in this particular case. And the running variable is going to uh, determine whether or not they get the um, they get the uh, treatment. Okay, so let's start uh, to identify uh, these conditions using the graphical analysis. We'll start with the first one. Assignment rule must be clear and follow with a high degree of fidelity. Okay, so let's switch uh, to Stata and using Stata, I'm going to upload the uh, RDD simulated data, which you can find um, in the course uh, website. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, variables with, within, this, um, within this data set. So you have the ID, so the ID is going to provide you information on the individual's unique ID. And then gender is going to be an indicator of gender. And then SPED is an indicator whether or not the individual is involved in a special education. Uh, and then the next variable is free or reduced price lunch. And then the English of uh, second language, um, and then an indicator for black, an indicator for white, an indicator uh, for Hispanic, an indicator for Asian, 
the age of the student and then the pretest. And the pretest is going to be our um, and the pretest is going to be our running variable, and the cutoff is going to determine whether or not the individual received the treatment or not. Uh, treatment itself is a binary indicator, which is equal to one if an individual received the treatment, zero otherwise, and post-test is going to be uh, the outcome variable of interest. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do just a little bit, uh, you know, uh, some cleaning of the data set just to make sure that everything is going to be able to be um, analyzed uh, properly. So, oops. So we're going to generate a new variable and the new variable is going to be a female which is equal to one if the individual is a female or the gender is equal to zero. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to label uh, the data set, you know, just to make sure that it's going to come up nicely um, in Stata when we do analysis. Okay, so the first analysis that we want to do is we want to see what's the relationship uh, between the treatment status and the running variable. And so the easiest way to do it is just to do a scatter plot on the treatment variable treat and the running variable uh, pretest. Okay. Now, as you can see, um, individuals below some threshold is going to receive the treatment. So the treatment status is equal to one and individual um, above threshold is not going to receive the treatment or uh, G is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so this graphic, while it provide us with an intuition on the distribution of uh, the distribution of uh, observations below and above the threshold. Uh, we can do better in terms of uh, how informative um, how informative the graph looks like. And so I'm going to do uh, another uh, graph, and so hopefully this graphic now will be more intuitive. Okay. Okay. So. I'm going to run a graph and then now you can see that uh, the graph looks more intuitive in the sense that okay we have information that the y-axis is the treatment status, the x-axis is the running variable and the running variable is a pretest score and then um, you know um, those uh, above the threshold is going to be the control group and those below the threshold is going to be the treatment group. So we have more informative graph uh, that is going to be useful for uh, identifying uh, who receives the treatment and those and, uh, and who doesn't receive the treatment. Now, it's a good practice, uh, by the way, in Stata uh, to do what's called centering. Okay, so uh, what does centering mean? So centering means that uh, we're going to center the running variable at the cutoff point. So how do we do that? Well. It's quite straightforward. So centering is just the pretest, the running variable, minus the cutoff. So it's going to be centered around the cutoff. Now, after we do the centering, what we can do is that we're going to do uh, the same graph. Now, however, um, as you can see, uh, for this uh, for the same graph, uh, you'll see that now uh, the uh, center is not the cutoff point anymore, but the center now is going to be zero. So this is going to be relatively useful when we're doing analysis, uh, just to know that the center now is going to be zero. Okay, and so that's going to be uh, the first one uh, to see the assignment rule must be clear and followed with a high degree of fidelity. Okay. Now, the second one is that the running variable is an ordinal measure with a sufficient density on either side of the cutoff. Okay, so we know that uh, score is an ordinal measure, so uh, it shows you, um, you know, the rank of um, the individuals in terms of the score, and we can, you know, readily observe that the observations to the right of the cutoff and the observations to the left of the cutoff. Um, are quite sufficient. So it doesn't have to be the same. So the observations to the right of the threshold does not have to be the same with the observations to the left of the threshold. However, we need sufficient observations. Uh, we need those observations to make sure that, you know, our eventual um, estimation is going to be well powered. 
Okay, so the third uh, the third conditions that we're going to need for valid causal inference is that units cannot manipulate their own value of the running variable. And so uh, what we're going to use is a manipulation test by Kataneo, Jensen, and Ma, which was a paper back in 2017 entitled Simple Local Polynomial Density Estimators. So the test uh, uses local polynomial density estimation methods to test for self selection as well as sorting so uh, we want to identify whether individuals self-select around the threshold the idea is that suppose that uh, someone knew uh, the cutoff point and so individuals would want to manipulate um, you know their test uh, or their test score or their running variable such that they receive the treatment or the other way around they, they want to manipulate their test score so that they don't receive the treatment really depends on the context and the case that we're dealing with but um, this test is going to allow us to identify or uh, provide us with a, a statistical test on whether there is that self-selection or sorting around the threshold okay so uh, we'll take a look at this uh, graph in Stata um, so I'm going to use um, so I'm going to open up Stata and then I'm going to use a a scheme that will allow us to produce a relatively uh, clean graph and um, what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, at the density test using a test by Kataneo, Jensen and Ma. So I provided you with an instruction uh, so that uh, we'll be able to um, use the RD density uh, in the uh, Stata graphics. Okay, so I'm going to run uh, the test, so the test is quite straightforward. So you just have to click. Uh, you you just have to uh, type RT density uh, test center, and then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a uniform kernel. Okay, so I'll explain you a little bit of what it means to use a uniform kernel. So uh, there are various uh, kernel that you can use. So kernel basically is a weighting. Uh, mechanism. So if you choose a uniform kernel, it means that you weigh each observation using the same weight. There is also a triangle um, kernel, so it means that the closer that you get to the threshold, then the weight actually increases. There's also um, the Epashnikov um, kernel, which means that um, the higher you get to the uh, to the uh, to the cutoff point. The higher the weight but it's increasing at a decreasing rate so um, let's take a look at this uh, particular graph okay uh, so this is the manipulation uh, testing plot um, so as you can see there's a distribution to the right of the cutoff and there's a distribution to the left of the cutoff now uh, there doesn't seem to be a jump right at the threshold and so this provides you with a um, kind of like a quick look that there might not be a manipulation now uh, we can also confirm that using a statistical test uh, provided in Stata so if you scroll up uh, then uh, the t value is going to be negative point one zero nine fifty five or the p-value is zero point two seven three three so the null hypothesis is that there is no manipulation around the threshold and we can see that uh, using the t-value the p using the p-value uh, we can uh, conclude that the null hypothesis is not rejected and so we can also uh, conclude that there is no manipulation around the threshold point Okay, so the last one is that the running variable is used to assign units to treatments. Differences in outcome should not be attributable to other potential mechanisms. So uh, what you like to see here is that, um, you know, the only jump that we'll see is a jump on the outcome around the, around the uh, threshold. But we should not be able to see 
uh, jump in the any explanatory variables that uh, we have. And so if there is any jump in the explanatory variables across the cutoff, then we're not going to be sure whether the you know the differences in outcomes around the threshold is due to the treatments or other variables uh, you know that can be explained. Okay, so we'll take a particular look of an example for H. Okay, so there are several steps in conducting this, this analysis, and uh, we'll go back uh, to Stata to discuss this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, do uh, the bandwidth selection, so the optimal bandwidth selection. And so in this particular case, what I want to do is that I want to do RDBW select, okay? And then I'm going to be interested in looking at the age and uh, the centered test score, okay? I'm going to use a kernel, um, you know, uniform kernel, and I'm going to use a zero cutoff since we're using uh, test centered. And then I'm going to use just a linear function, uh, which is polynomial of degree one. And um, the method that I'm going to select uh, is going to be mean squared error. Okay, so uh, if we hit enter and the RDBW select is going to provide us with the optimal bandwidth. And so the optimal bandwidth is actually about 10 to the left of the cutoff and 10 to the right of the cutoff. Now, since the number of observations to the left and to the right of the cutoff are particularly uh, quite similar, and so we can see that the bandwidth are actually similar on both sides. The optimal bandwidth are actually similar on both sides of the threshold. Now, if you have a significantly different number of observations to the left of the cutoff and to the right of the cutoff, then it could be the case that the um, the bandwidth are going to be different to the left and to the right of the cutoff. Okay, so basically you have uh, optimal bandwidth of 10 to the left and then you have an optimal bandwidth uh, to the right. Now the next thing to do is just to determine the number of pins. And since, um, you know, the minimum of test center is negative 45 to the left and then the maximum of test center is 52 on the right. And so basically you have about 45 divided by 10, which is about 4.5 pins to the left, and then 52 divided by 9, which is about 5.3 uh, 5 or 5.4 to the right of the cutoff. So basically, you have six pins to the left of the cutoff, and you have, sorry, you have four, uh, five pins to the left of the cutoff, rounded up, and you have six pins, uh, six pins to the right of the cutoff, rounded up again. And so, given that knowledge, I'm going to use an RD plot for H and then test center uh, using uh, center using the same uh, method. So we're going to use a uniform kernel. Um, I'm going to set that the cutoff point is zero, which is zero, and then the polynomial of one. And then the number of pins should be five to the left and then six to the right, okay? All right, so let's take a look. Um, and then this is going to be an illustration of the uh, graph. As you can see, there is no significant jump. There is a little bit of jump, but um, you know, I think we can be confident that the jump is not going to be statistically significant. You know, we should do an um, as an estimate later on, but here we can see that uh, the jump is not significant. Okay, and uh, you know, we can do this for um, other uh, observations to the left. And uh, we can uh, do this for other variables, explanatory variables, and so that's something that uh, we can do. All right, so um, the idea is that we want to show uh, to the, uh, we want to show to the readers that there is no jump in the explanatory variable around the threshold. And so you can do this analysis for uh, many of the variables that are available. So this is always a good practice to see that there is a balanced covariance, particularly around the threshold. Okay, now, since we're confident that there is a high degree of uh, fidelity on the running variable on the treatment status, uh, we're also confident that 
after conducting the test there is no manipulation uh, around the threshold and uh, there is no other mechanisms uh, other than uh, the treatment status itself and so what we can do is we're now able to see the running variables and the outcomes okay so the same routine we're going to do rdw select and for this particular case i'm going to use the uh, the outcome of interest which is the test after the uh, intervention has been implemented and then test center okay uh, we're going to use the same uh, kernel of uniform um, and then the cutoff point is zero because we're using the test center and then we're going to use p of uh, p of one okay um, and then uh, using this method we're going to be able to see what's the optimal bandwidth to the left of the treatment and uh, to the left of the threshold and the optimal bandwidth to the right of the threshold now again uh, the optimal bandwidth is actually not that far away uh, from the one that we obtain for the age variable in this particular case uh, the bandwidth to the left is about nine and the bandwidth to the right is about nine as well and so since we have a minimum of neg uh, 45 negative 45 to the left of the uh, cutoff so negative 45 divided by nine is about five and then we have about 52 on the right so 52 divided by nine is about six and so uh, we can do an RD plot of post-test um, and then test uh, centered. A kernel is the same, which is a uniform, and then C of 0, P of 1. And then there are going to be five observations to the left of the cutoff point, and then about six pins, sorry, five pins to the left of the cutoff points, and then six pins to the right of the cutoff point. Okay. And so here, uh, is going to be the regression function fit and as you can see there is that jump um, around the threshold okay now again uh, this is very preliminary um, you know to make sure whether or not this jump is statistically significant or not we have to do an estimation now again uh, you know just from a uh, just from a casual observation uh, we can see that uh, there is that jump, so probably that's something that uh, we want to in investigate further, whether or not this is statistically significant or not. And so uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go back uh, here, and then we're going to discuss uh, we're going to discuss the estimation method. Okay, so we're going to go through uh, the estimation for the sharp RDP. So we want to make sure. Uh, we want to estimate whether the jump uh, that we see around the threshold is actually statistically significant or not. Okay, so to learn how to estimate, we're going to learn about local linear regression first. And so uh, let's look at the local model that we need to estimate. So think of Y as an outcome and think of X as the uh, running variable. And you can also see little x and think of little x as the cutoff point C that we see in the sharp regression discontinuity design setup. So uh, the intercept of the model or G of x is actually going to be the estimated outcome conditional on x equals to the cutoff point little x. So what we're interested in is actually to estimate alpha x, uh, which is and the intercept uh, when x is equal to little x and then we're also interested in the slope of the running variable x when x is equal to the cutoff point so this is going to be an illustration of a local linear regression um, so why do we call this a local linear regression well we call this a local linear regression because it's a linear regression in a specific bandwidth h or local to that bandwidth so suppose that um, you saw in the previous example in stata that your bandwidth was 9 then you're going to regress it within negative 9 and 9 okay so um, as you can see here uh, basically you want to estimate uh, you want to choose alpha and beta that minimizes uh, the sum of square of the error 
uh, for a specific bandwidth okay this is a weighted regression of y on x now as you can see if the bandwidth gets large and close to the infinity then the local linear estimator actually collapses to the OLS regression of y on x okay and so this is basically just an OLS within a specific bandwidth now in our case we aim to estimate the causal effect of the treatment status and the causal effect of the treatment status is going to be denoted with tau you can use other um, you can use other um, notation but in this particular case is tau now let x hat be the centered running variable such that x hat is equal to x minus the cutoff point and let h be the bandwidth then y is going to be equal to alpha plus beta x hat so beta here is going to provide you or provide you with uh, the estimate of the slope of the of the running variable and then tau d uh, is going that now tau is going to be uh, the estimate of the causal effect of the treatment status d now again what we're interested in is actually to estimate this within a specific bandwidth h okay uh, or in other words uh, we're going to choose alpha beta and tau that minimizes uh, the sum square of error within a specific bandwidth okay so let's go to stata and in stata we'll provide you with a uh, discussion on how to do this analysis and so basically you're going to regress uh, post-test and then test centered and then treat so test centered is going to be the x hat treat is going to be the d okay if uh, test centered is higher than or equal to negative 9 and test uh, centered is lower than or equal uh, to 9 and we can use the robust to make sure that we use a heteroskedasis robust estimate of the standard error okay now uh, here you can see that uh, the estimated beta which is the slope of the test center is about 0 0.85 and it's statistically significant however what we're interested in the most is actually the estimated tau which is the estimated impact of the treatment now the estimated impact of the treatment is about 10 and it is statistically significant uh, even at the 0 0.01 uh, level or even 0 0.001 uh, significance level and so this is uh, this is uh, really significant and so we can conclude that at least from this regression that the treatment the effect of the treatment or the effect of the intervention is an increase in test score by 10 points okay now um, let's go back uh, to, uh, let's go back to the lecture slide and see that we can actually have an alternative specification now what if uh, the running variable slopes is different below and above the cutoff okay now let's go back uh, to several slides um, in this particular slide uh, you know we see that the slope to the right and the slope to the left of the cutoff is actually quite similar however is it really similar uh, statistically that's something that we can see uh, just by eyeballing it and so what we're going to do is we're going to estimate whether or not the slope to the right and slope to the le uh, left of the cutoff point is statistically different or not it looks quite similar but it's always good to check whether or not uh, it's significant or not now in this particular case what we're going to do is we're going to add another variable and that variable is actually the interaction variable between the test center and the treatment status d again we're still interested in estimating tau um, however uh, we're now accommodating the fact that the slope of the running variable could be different to the left and to the right of the cutoff so this provides you with a more flexible specification um, to accommodate a different curvature okay now again we're still going to estimate it uh, within the bandwidth um, but again our variable of interest is still going to be um, out. okay so uh, let's go back uh, to stata and in stata 
we're going to estimate uh, the impact using a more flexible approach. So I'm going to just uh, recycle the command. Now, instead of uh, estimating it on the post test and test center, what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare to state that the test center is a continuous variable. Um, and then treat is an indicator variable. In this case, it's a binary variable. And what we're going to do is I'm going to regress it on test center, the treatment variable, and the interaction between test center and the treat vari uh, treatment variable. And we're going to do it within uh, the optimal bandwidth. Okay. So um, in this particular case, uh, we can see the estimate of beta, which is the slope of the a running variable to the left of the cutoff point uh, I'm sorry to the right of the cutoff point um, and then this is the estimate of the impact of the uh, treatment and this is going to be uh, the indicate uh, a coefficient that indicates whether or not the slope between um, you know observations to the left and to the right are going to be similar or not In this particular case uh, the estimated coefficient is not statistically significant so basically the uh, the interaction is zero what does this imply well it implies that the slope to the left and to the right of the cutoff points are actually basically similar okay now again we're still interested in looking at the effect of the treatment and uh, we can observe that the impact of the treatment is about 10 so uh, you know, the intervention increases the test score by about 10 points. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's go back uh, to the slide. Uh, again, uh, we can also have a nonlinear running variable. And so if you believe that the slope to the right and then the slope to the left of the cutoff point is nonlinear, and then what you can do is actually get that uh, nonlinear variable. And so in this particular case, not only that you want to regress it on um, x hat, but you also want to regress it on x hat square. <coughs> Excuse me. And the treatment status. Uh, and then an interaction variable uh, between the x, uh, test, uh, the x hat and the treatment status. And then x hat square and the treatment status. Okay. So this is going to be an estimate of the impact uh, D, taking into account that the slope to the right and to the left of the treatment could be non-linear. Okay. Now, uh, there is no reason to believe that our uh, setting is non-linear uh, because it looks relatively flat, but it's always good to try. Now, another thing is that we're not, uh, we're not limited to just a uh, polynomial of degree two. So x1, x hat, and x hat square. Uh, you can have a polynomial of degree 3, a polynomial of degree 4, and polynomial of degree 5. So that's something that you can explore conditional on the curvature of the data. And so, again, why do we want to do a graphical analysis? Well, a graphical analysis is actually going to provide you with that intuition on the uh, curvature of the running variable when we later do the estimation. Okay. Now, Imbens and Lemieux uh, suggested that, you know, we should investigate uh, the, estimate, uh, the estimate of the causal effects uh, for a different choice of bandwidth, okay? Now, why do you want to do this? Well, we want to see whether or not the estimation is actually sensitive uh, to different bandwidth. So, um, you know, I'm going to go back to Stata, and then I created a syntax such that we're going to be able uh, to identify um, the impact for different bandwidth. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to start with the optimal bandwidth as estimated by uh, the RDBW select package. And then I'm going to use half of that optimal bandwidth, twice of that optimal bandwidth, and then four times of that optimal bandwidth. We want to see whether or not uh, the estimated causal effects are actually similar or not so I'm gonna run that oh, oh my bad oops my bad uh, there could be oh okay so I'm gonna run that uh, this estimate and then uh, what we can see uh, in Stata is that the estimated impact for different 
optimal bandwidth is actually quite similar and that is actually centered around 10. Um, since this is a simulated data, the actual impact is about 10 points. And so here uh, we can see that the estimated uh, impact is around 10 points. Now, uh, how can you be sure that it's about 10 points? Well, if you can see 10 is still within one standard error of the estimates that we see here. Okay, another thing to point out is that the larger the bandwidth, the lower the standard error. Okay, so for half of the optimal bandwidth, the standard error is 1.445 or 1.5, but then if you have twice the bandwidth, then uh, your standard error is uh, only 0 0.724. Why? Because when you increase that bandwidth, then um, the number of observations that you use for the uh, estimation of the impact increases. And as you know, if the number of observations increases, the standard error always decreases. And so here there is that trade-off uh, between uh, biasness and precision. Okay. So the closer that you get to the optimal bandwidth, then uh, the less bias of the estimate of the impact. However, it's going to be less precise. Why? Because you have lower number of observations. However, as you increase the, the band, then uh, the, the um, biasness could start to increase, but then we have a better precision. So the estimated, um, you know, the optimal bandwidth actually balance out between uh, biasness and precision. Okay. Now, it's also good practice to know, uh, you know, the estimate if we have the full sample. But again, if you have the full sample, then the estimate could be biased. Um, in this particular ten, uh, case, 10 is actually outside of one standard error of the true impact of 10. Okay. Uh, however, you have a good precision since you have a lot of observations in that particular case. Okay. All right. So um, that's going to be the specification check uh, that we need if we want to use uh, if you want to use uh, one bandwidth just to see whether or not the estimated impact is sensitive or not. But again, always remember that there is a trade-off between uh, unbiasedness and precision uh, depending on the size of the bandwidth. Okay, welcome back uh, to the second part of the lecture where we discuss the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. This is a, an extension of the sharp regression discontinuity design that we uh, discussed earlier. However, in this particular case, the discontinuity is actually on the probability of receiving the treatment. Okay, so let's see the subtle difference between the sharp and the, uh, the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. As in the sharp regression discontinuity case, assignment to treatment group is based on a selection criteria X. However, while in the sharp regression discontinuity design, the treatment status is a deterministic function of the uh, selection criterion X or the running variable X. However, in the fuzzy regression discontinuity design, it's no longer a deterministic function. So the le uh, selection criteria only affects the probability of treatment at the cutoff. So the treatment incentive may not be strong enough to move or, uh, eligible non-participants uh, to take up the treatment. Okay. Uh, so in this particular case, there is a discontinuity in the probability of treatment at the cutoff. So let's take a look at the setup. So instead of uh, using D, I'm now going to use T. So T is going to be an indicator of assignment to treatment. So an individual is assigned to the treatment or t is equal to 1 if the value of the running variable is higher or equal to the cutoff point and 0 otherwise. Now again, this is an assignment to treatment but not actual treatment received. Okay. So again, t is going to be assignment of the treatment and then d is going to be the actual receipt. Now in the sharp regression discontinuity design case, everyone who, is, who are assigned to the treatment or t is equal to 1 is going to get the treatment. So t is equal to 1. So in this particular case, then d is equal to t. However, in the fuzzy regression discontinuity case, not everyone who are assigned to the treatment group 
is going to get the treatment. And so in this particular case, the actual treatment received D is not going to be equal to the assignment to the treatment T. Okay, so the assumption for this is that suppose that the probability of D is equal to 1 or the probability of receiving treatment conditional on the running variable equal to x will be the probability of receiving treatment given a running variable. And so the probability to get the treatment conditional on x close to the cutoff point from above is going to be different with the expected probability of getting the, uh, the uh, intervention for individuals um, to the left of the cutoff. Okay? So the idea is that there is a discontinuity in the probability of reaching the treatment at the cutoff point C. So that's going to be something that we're going to leverage for the uh, estimation. Okay, so again, uh, the probabilities of receiving treatment of individuals just above and below the cutoff are going to be different. So basically, there is no crossover. So there is a crossover or there is a no-show. So individuals who are assigned to the treatment didn't get, uh, didn't get or didn't take the treatment. Individuals who are not assigned to the treatment uh, get the treatment. So that's a crossover. Or it could be the fact that individuals who receive the treatment didn't take the treatment, so there's a no-show, okay? Um, so alternatively, there are basically two uh, probability functions. So uh, the probability of receiving the treatment to the right of the cutoff is going to be GI of X, and then the probability of receiving the treatment to the left of the cutoff is going to be G0X. And G0, it means uh, left, and G1 is going to be uh, the function to the right. Okay, so um, we'll talk about the fuzzy regression discontinuity design and uh, the local average treatment effect. So again, uh, we're taking advantage of uh, the treatment assignment as an instrument for the treatment status. So basically the assignment to treatment is going to induce individuals to take the treatment. Excuse me. So. Uh, the assignment to treatment is going to be used as an instrument to the endogenous treatment status D. Okay, so D is going to be endogenous and then uh, the treatment status T is going to be the instrument. So the assignment status or the, the uh, assignment status T is going to affect the outcome Y only through the treatment status D at the cutoff point. Okay. So uh, recall the potential value of treatment for some running variable x. So d of i x is equal to 1 and d of i x is equal to 0. So this is the potential value of treatment of some uh, running variable. So we need additional assumptions. Um, so the assumptions that we need is going to be an assumption of monotonicity. So there exists some small number e such that uh, uh, there's, there exists a very small number of epsilon such that um, you know d of i the cutoff plus that a small number e is going to be larger to or equal than d i of c minus e for all uh, e between zero and a very small number of epsilon. So basically, uh, this assumption means that no individual is discouraged from taking the treatment by crossing uh, the cutoff point c. Okay. Uh, another assumption is local exogeneity of the forcing variable. So uh, we're interested here in X, uh, the running variable. So in a neighborhood of the cutoff point, uh, then the running variable X is going to be independent of the impact and the potential treatment value uh, D of I. Okay. So in other words, the running variable is randomly assigned around the cutoff point. So this is going to be very important uh, since we're going to take advantage of the treatment status as the uh, treatment assignment as the instrument. Okay, so um, in this particular case, I just want you to recall the concept of compliers. And so if you recall uh, from the instrumental variable lecture, uh, then we have uh, several groups. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a group, uh, we have uh, individuals 
uh, who if assigned to a treatment uh, get uh, a treatment and who is assigned to the control uh, take the treatment. In that particular case, the individual is an always taker. But there is also the case that if individual is assigned to the treatment, he will take the treatment. If an individual is assigned to the control group, he's not going to take the control group. Or in other words, the individual is a complier. Okay? So, uh, again, um, you know, just not to um, uh, do the uh, discussions again, but uh, we can recall the uh, discussions from the instrumental variable heterogeneous effect. Can we see an individual's compliance status? Well, uh, the answer is uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, we can observe individuals who take the treatment. We can uh, observe individuals who do not take the treatment. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, uh, we can never see the actual compliance status. We can only see the observed uh, compliance status. So for individual uh, who obtain a treatment assignment of one and obtain a treatment, that's going to be a complier. Then individuals who get a treatment assignment of zero and do not take the treatment is going to be a complier. However, individuals who do not uh, receive a treatment status in one but gets the treatment, then that's going to be assumed as an always taker. And individuals who receive a treatment status, uh, a treatment assignment of one but didn't take the treatment is going to be regarded as um, never taker or assumed to be a never taker uh, in this particular case. Okay, so again, uh, we have the compliers, we have the always takers. So whatever the treatment is, uh, whatever the assignment uh, status, is going to always take the treatment. And we also have the neighbor takers. So he never uh, takes the treatment, whatever the assignment status is. So we're interested in the fuzzy regression discontinuity estimate. So which is the uh, expected uh, differences in outcomes uh, to the left and to the right of the cutoff points. Uh, divided by the expected probability of reaching treatment to the right and to the left of the cutoff. So basically, uh, we want to investigate the ratio between the effect of threshold on the outcome and the effect of threshold on the probability of receiving uh, the treatment. So uh, this is going to be the estimated impact of the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. Okay, so basically, since we're going to use a fuzzy regression discontinuity design, then what we can do is we can actually use a two-stage least square. So the first stage estimation will be the dummy variable, uh, the treatment status on the running variable, uh, the center running variable, which is x hat, as well as the uh, treatment assignment. So again, the treatment assignment t is going to be the instrumental uh, variable uh, in this particular case. So we're going to regress the endogenous treatment status on um, the instrument, which is the treatment assignment T. Now, after you do the first uh, estimation, you actually get an estimate of D, and the estimate of D is going to be D hat, and so you're going to regress the outcome on the test center and the estimated probability of receiving the treatment at D hat. Okay? Um, so the estimated impact using the fuzzy regression discontinuity design is going to be tau. Okay, and in the instrumental variable setting, we can also get um, what's called the reduced form. So the reduced form is actually a regression of the outcome, not on the treatment status, but actually to the instrumental variable, or in this particular case, is the treatment assignment. Now, tau in this particular case is not going to estimate um, the treatment effect or the local average treatment effect, but it's actually going to estimate the intent to treat effect. So uh, it's going to estimate the impact for uh, everyone who are assigned to the treatment. So this is called ITT or intent to treat effect. Okay, so. Uh, let's go into the graphical analysis, um, and so um, the routine that we're going to do for the fuzzy regression discontinuity design is actually quite similar with the routine that we're uh, that we've done for the sharp regression discontinuity design. So basically, you want to see the relationship between the running variable 
and the treatment status. Now, in this particular case, as you can see, there is a crossover uh, at the threshold point. So it's not a deterministic function, but there are individuals, uh, you know, um, who are not assigned to the treatment, but actually get the treatment and, so, uh, and the opposite, okay? We can also do the manipulation tests. Uh, we can use the same test by Cataneo, Jensen, and Ma. Uh, and so in this particular case, we want to see whether or not there is a manipulation across around the threshold, um, around the cutoff point, okay? Um, in this particular case, we can see that there seems to be no difference in the uh, estimated, uh, uh, there's no difference in the light around the threshold. So. This is a big indication that there is no manipulation around the threshold. Of course, after this, we're going to see Stata uh, just to look at, um, just to confirm uh, statistically whether there is a manipulation or not. And at the end of the day, what we're interested in is actually to estimate uh, the impact around the threshold. So that's something that we're going to see uh, in the fuzzy regression discontinuity case. And let's go to Stata. Uh, uh, to start uh, looking at the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So uh, the data that we're going to use is going to be fuzzy RDD. Uh, so let's take a look at the variables uh, available in this data set. So again, this is going to be a simulated data set. So, um, you know, everything is going to be relatively straightforward. Um, here there's an ability variable. Uh, there is the running variable pretest. Um, there is an assignment status. So uh, eligibility means that t is equal to 1 is eligible and if it's not eligible then t is going to be equal to 0. Uh, we also have the centered pretest score and we have an indicator of whether or not the individual get the scholar. So this is basically the treatment variable t and then this is the outcome of interest. So uh, the first thing that uh, we want to do is actually we want to see whether or not there is a um, difference in the uh, or there is a high fidelity of the treatment. So uh, what we're going to do here is actually look at the graph. Okay, now uh, we can see that uh, this is very similar, but we can see that there is a crossover. So individuals um, who are actually not assigned uh, to get the treatment actually gets the treatment, and individuals. Uh, who was assigned uh, to get the treatment was not uh, did not get the treatment. So there is this issue on the um, on the eligibility in the sense that this is not a deterministic function of whether or not an individual is eligible or not. So uh, we're going to take advantage on the uh, discontinuity in the probability of receiving the uh, treatment or not. Um, so the next step is to see whether or not. Um, there is a manipulation around the threshold. And so for that particular case, what we're interested in is we're going to use um, we're going to use the RT density test uh, by Cataneo, Jensen, and Ma. Okay. So uh, again, this is going to be relatively straightforward. We're going to do RD density uh, density, and then uh, around the uh, centered uh, pretest. Um, and then we're going to use plot and then kernel uh, uniform. Okay, now as you can see uh, in this graph, this is quite similar to the one that we see in the, um, in the uh, lecture note, um, there doesn't seem to be a jump around the threshold. So there is an indication that there is no manipulation around the threshold. Uh, however, it's always good to look at the test statistic uh, provided in Stata. Now, as you can see, the t-test is going to be 0 0.1366, very uh, close to 0. And the p-value is 0 0.8914. So in this particular case, we can observe that the null hypothesis is not rejected. So there is no manipulation uh, around, the, uh, around the threshold. Okay. Now. Uh, again, uh, we're going to do uh, the same uh, routine. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify the optimal bandwidth and given the optimal bandwidth, we're going to do uh, the plot. So let's do RDBW select um, and then post test and then the, 
the centered uh, pretest. Okay, uh, and I'm going to use kernel of uh, uniform, and then uh, the cutoff of zero, and then p of one, and then I'm going to use MSD RT. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, the bandwidth is uh, three. And to the left of the cutoff, and the bandwidth is um, about uh, three also to the right of the cutoff. Okay, mm -hmm. so in this particular case, we have uh, the minimum uh, value of uh, pretest, center pretest to the left is about 19. So uh, 19 divided by three, we get about uh, six plus, so we can use seven pins to the left. And then we have uh, 10, um, the maximum value of 10 to the right. So 10 divided by three is about uh, three ish, so we can use four pins uh, to the right of the cutoff. And so, given that knowledge, I'm going to use RD plot, and then post test C underscore uh, pretest, uh, kernel uniform, and then C0 P1, uh, polynomial of one, and then the number of pins uh, to the left is seven, and the number of pins to the right is four. Okay. Now, in this case, we're going to uh, be able to uh, observe that there is a bit of a jump around the threshold, and so that's going to be a um, kind of like a indicator on the impact of the scholarship on the treatment. Now, again, uh, whether or not this is um, significant or not is something that we cannot readily observe using this uh, graphical function. However, uh, we can do an estimation uh, using the IV to get this estimate. Okay, so uh, let's go back uh, to Stata uh, to do the estimation. Now, however, for this uh, estimation, I'm going to define uh, several variables. So the first variable that I'm going to uh, define is a variable called above, which is an interaction variable between the C pretest, the center pretest, and an indicator of eligibility T, and then a variable below which is going to be um, the interaction between the pretest and then one minus uh, eligible, okay? And so uh, we have a bandwidth of three. So that's going to be the bandwidth that we're going to use. And so uh, I'm going to use the optimal bandwidth of three uh, to use the, uh, to do the estimation. So the estimation is going to be IV regress, okay? And then two SLS. So we're going to use a two stage least square and then the outcome of interest is going to be post test and then the endogenous variable is going to be scholar and the instrument is going to be eligible. So scholar is going to be the D and then eligible is going to be the T. So we have above and below and then we have uh, ability. Okay, so uh, above is going to be an indicator between the uh, pretest and the um, and the pretest and the eligible, and then below is going to be the pretest and one minus the eligible. And ability is a control variable uh, that we care about. So we can use if C pretest is higher or equal to negative three, and C and C uh, pretest is going to be equal, uh, lower than uh, three. Okay, and uh, we can also request data to show the first stage estimation. And we can also use a Tronskidasis theory robust uh, standard error. Okay, um, so let's try. Um, so let's take a look at the first stage uh, regression. So uh, again, what we're interested in is to actually look at the effect of eligibility on uh, treatment status. So uh, in general, individuals who are eligible have about 66.25 percentage point a higher of getting uh, the treatment, okay? So in this particular case, uh, the eligibility status is a strong uh, instrument for the, uh, for the, uh, for the treatment uh, status D. We can definitely check that uh, using the ESTAT first stage as you've seen in the instrumental variable lecture. So you can uh, clarify that independently. Now, what we care about is actually uh, the estimated impact of the scholarship. 
So the estimated impact of the scholarship in this particular case is about 4.2. So it is also statistically significant. So um, receiving the scholarship increases the test score by about 4.2 points. Okay. Um, and so we can also use the estimated 95% confidence interval. So the estimated impact is between 3.8 to 4.5. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at a different um, estimate using a different bandwidth. And so I'm going to just recycle uh, the command. And so this is going to be the estimated impact uh, for the full uh, for the uh, for the full bandwidth. Okay, so the estimated impact is about 4.2. Uh, we can also check what would happen if we use half of the uh, optimal bandwidth. Uh, in this particular case. The estimated impact is also quite similar at 4.2 uh, and we can also look at uh, the estimated impact if we use twice uh, the optimal bandwidth. So in that particular case is 6. And so if we use twice the optimal bandwidth, the estimate coefficient looks a little bit different uh, but it's still around the true impact of 4. Okay. And lastly, uh, we can also use the uh, full uh, observations and in this particular case um, the estimated impact is about 4. So um, although the number on the estimated coefficient is different so you can see 4.2, 3.9 and then 4.02 is actually around 4 uh, as you can see from the 95% confidence interval and so it means that the estimated uh, coefficients are not that sensitive to the change of the bandwidth. So we can be confident on the impact of the scholarship on the test score is about four points. Okay, so uh, this is the end for the fuzzy regression discount unity lecture. Now, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in um, the next lecture.